Hi, I'm Othias, and this is the Colt Double Action Army, popularly known to collectors as the Model 1878. It's a big old hunk of iron, but we'll get more into why it exists in a moment. For now, let's go ahead and get into the light box. Weighing in just under two and one half pounds and with an overall length of 10.4 inches when fitted with a 5.5 inch barrel like we have here, this is a very large old world service revolver, which is fitting because it chambers the powerful 45 Colt cartridge, six of them gate loaded into the cylinder. Howdy y'all! If you're the sort to enjoy in-depth, contextualized, rooty tooty point and shooty content, then please consider supporting us on one of the platforms that you see listed on your screen now. Thank you. Now this episode assumes that you've seen the previous on the Colt 1877, because we've already covered the market pressure that led Colt to finally introduce a triple action pistol. That's single and double action, mind you. The Colt 1877, however, was a small bore civilian oriented handgun. And as you might recall, Colt's London agent, Frederick von Oppen, was very concerned with the possibility of the British Army finally adopting a revolver, officially. Knowing the British market as he did, von Oppen repeatedly warned Colt's vice president and general agent, William Franklin, that they would need a self cocking revolver if they wanted to even be acknowledged by the British officers. Colts apparently saw the encroaching double action pistols as two separate markets, compact civilian and full size heavy and rugged military large bore models. For the US market, this would be the single action army of 1873. As you might have guessed, this was not a self cocking design. Being popular in the US for being rugged and powerful at fairly long ranges for a handgun, it had failed to impress very many of the Empire's officers. That's because they had long been accustomed to double action or even triple action revolvers all the way back to the Adams 1851 percussion pistol. Unlike the guerrilla fighting, long marching, undersupplied US frontiersmen who favored long range power and ammo conservation, the British officer expected to have a line of men armed with rifle and bayonet, they would more likely need their revolvers if their lines were failing, or if they were jumped in an inopportune time by an unhappy local sort of off the battlefield. So, the British favored rapid fire. Yes, big bore for terminal effect, but significantly less concern about range. By example, in 1877, the most common cartridge in pistol service would be the 450 Adams. Evolved from converting from percussion to center fire, this was a very short cased black powder cartridge, making it a slow mover and very short range. But the bullet was great in diameter and consequently an acceptable man stopper when used close up. The demand for a 450 double action was so great that Von Oppen actually requested a Colt 1877 rechambered for the fatter cartridge. His suggestion was to simply make it a five shot, and it seems Franklin actually considered the matter as a wooden model was sent out in March of 1878. Now, one major problem with spending a lot of time on a 455 shot 1877 was that it couldn't handle the massive Colt 45 cartridge. This magnificent round was the standard chambering for the single action army, and while the revolver was unpopular across the pond, the cartridge was actually turning heads. There would actually be a fair bit of debate around whether or not it should be adopted for the Empire, and likely influence further changes to their domestic cartridges. The best course for Colt would be to design a revolver large enough to handle not only 450 Adams, but also their own 45. That would give them the flexibility to market to either camp. And of course, the American military authorities were already happy with the 1873 and 45 Colt. If they happened to go looking for a double action, well, they'd be ready. From VP Franklin's letters, we get word that the 45 double action was already in the works as early as July of 1877, but we're unsure how far along it was. Once again, the design work was headed by William Mason, and you'd think that he would just scale up the old Colt 1877 and call it a day. And while it was a strong influence on the new pistol, some radical changes were made to make it service ready. While we sadly don't seem to have any notes available as to why certain decisions were put into effect, we can fairly safely reason that most of them had to do with making the new Marshall revolver more rugged and easier to work on and less sensitive to muck and sand. 
The result was this, single and double action, using the same barrel and rifling for either 45 Colt or 450 Atoms. Really the only change that had to be made either way was how you cut the cylinder, internally. Now with a single piece solid frame design, unlike the multi-piece frame of the 1877, this revolver sports an inspection plate taken right off the Colt New Line series. Very early examples like this one had checkered wood grips, which were fairly fat. And there would be one internal difference that I'm going to cover in a bit. That means that that gun is not quite the gun I have here today just yet, so patience please. The first shipment was made in May of 1878, which is why collectors call this the model 1878, although Colt simply called it the Double Action Army, at least at this point. The first example was sent to the man who deserved it most, Frederick von Oppen, who, being a consummate professional, immediately gave it harsh criticism. We can judge his complaints by a known response from Franklin in June of 1878. The top of the trigger had some roughness. This was corrected. There was some concern about fixing the arbor, however, I'm unsure why. Franklin explained that the arbor was free to rotate, for good reason, and I'll actually show you that in just a few moments. Open believed that the cylinder should be held in lock at all times, except during the moment of rotation. This actually goes back to our last episode's notes that some designs allowed the user to short release the trigger and thereby skip the operation of the hammer, a potentially fatal mistake at the wrong moment. While I don't have an example here, this is the interior of the first version of the Colt Double Action Army. There are only two significant changes from what our gun is today. The first is this clock style spring, which powers the hand. We'll see it simplified in our animation. Next was this counter rotation resistance spring, which flexed on the back of the cylinder when the trigger was released. This proved to be weak and easily broken, so it was fairly quickly replaced. We'll see a more efficient, stronger, and frankly surprising solution later on. Open also reported a number of misfires, meaning the firing pin wasn't striking hard enough. Period primers were very insensitive and required a strong mainspring to drive the hammer. Having learned from the same problem on the 1877, the 1878 already had an adjustment screw for that mainspring, which Franklin kindly pointed out to Von Oppen. Unfortunately, Von Oppen then noted that the mainsprings were liable to break under heavy use, which Colt apparently corrected quickly. Skipping a beat ahead, Colt would also hear back from various commercial trade partners who added their own complaints. Many disliked the grip shape, with some specifying the trigger was just too far forward from the back of the hand. When pulled, the weight was too great. It needed to be 2.5 pounds maximum, guys. However, if you lightened up the pull, you started to experience light strikes. Also, some considered the gun unbalanced, but that's probably a bit barrel dependent. Because of interest in penetrating the British market and perhaps catching the eye of their war department, which was now actively investigating the possibility of an army service revolver, Colt focused on the 450 Adams cartridge first for their initial production of new 1878 model revolvers. That means most of the early patterns that we encounter are chambered in 450 with 45 Colt coming in a distant second place. Early examples have the cartridge marked on the trigger guard, 45 cal for the 45 Colt and 45 cal for the 450. Well, at least 45 cal over the letter B. No confusion to be made there, folks. Actually, this gets a little worse for certain guns because of the interchangeable barrel thing. Some factory 45 Colt revolvers would be sent to London and when they didn't sell well, they would then have 450 atom cylinders sent over and swapped in, meaning that you might have a factory letter and a trigger guard that are lying to you. Eventually, the uh, cartridge marking would be moved to the barrel and written out fully. Early British market guns also tend to be shorter barreled, generally 5.5 inches in length, as was preferred in that particular market. Now normally in our show, we'd actually see a series of failed bids for government contracts, with the firearm being incrementally improved over the course of months or even years. And yeah, it's actually kind of true of the 1878. However, before any major change was made, it seems that they had their first martial contract. Unfortunately, it was very small and very desperate. Britain had purchased Colt's revolvers before, over 20,000 during the Crimean War, but these were the Percussion 1851, and while the Navy enjoyed them very much, going on to adopt other revolvers over the years, the Army considered them too vulnerable for hard service, and largely abandoned the revolver for general issue. 
Like we saw back in our Trantor episode, the outcome of the Russo-Turkish War seems to have changed the army's perspective, and they were soon reviewing and expanding their armaments. By December of 1877, even before the war was over, the army finally approved the adoption of the Adams Mark II centerfire revolver for cavalry use. By April of 1878, the Mark III had also been officially approved. These were both serviceable triple-action revolvers, but the Adams had only been made on a smaller naval and private purchase scale up until this point. And even while still short for cavalry use, they expanded the revolver's role to general service, meaning artillery, infantry officers, and more. Soon after, in January of 1879, British forces suffered a crushing defeat at the Battle of Isandlana against the massed forces of the Zulu Empire. Suddenly, the army very much wanted revolvers, and a lot of them. Adams couldn't keep up with the short-term demand, so the War Department had to reach out to the commercial market. The prime choice would be Tranter's Model 1878, a hefty triple action already in 450 Adams. 2000 would be ordered, but not all were accepted before the contract was changed. More on that another day. As we've already seen, upwards of 230 or so Tranter 1868s would also be pulled into emergency service, though these were less favored. The War Department also apparently contacted Colt's London Agency. Despite the desperation, it appears that only 165 were sold to the British government. We know this number, as Franklin congratulated von Alpen on 165 passing inspection by the War Department. So that may mean that they viewed more but only accepted 165, or they only asked for 165, or that only 165 were available in stores, which seems the least likely as 280 had been sent over at the beginning of the same month. Which, by the way, was March of 1879, which you can find marked on the left side frame, although it's usually covered by twin arrows, tip to tip, indicating being sold out of service at a later date. These guns are also marked CS over D, which is a bit of a mystery. By the way, the Tranters again were marked CS over A. All examples had 5.5 inch barrels, blued finish, and large wood grip plates. Their official name in the list of changes was pistol, revolver, breech loading, Colt, non-interchangeable. Oof, that's a burn. Especially because the Tranter 78 earned the title interchangeable. Now, for those of you who watched the previous episode, we saw VP Franklin deliver a wonderful declaration in one of his letters about competition from Remington. Well, here's another favorite of mine. Writing in July of 1879, Alpen conveys some further complaints about the new double action army. One of which is that he had recently received word of a British officer having shot another by accident, of course, while loading his revolver. This was, of course, implied to be the fault of the double action, and occasionally we do see references to accidental discharges from the 78. I've been unable to find how the mechanism might be able to accomplish this, and suspect that they were almost all negligence. Franklin seems to have felt the same, and his response is as follows. There will always be accidents among soldiers who use double action pistols, in excitement, a pistol that can be fired without a separate operation of cocking is a dangerous weapon to the user and his friends. He's not wrong. Now, despite the early start on martial contracts, the double action army would not be adopted by the British Armed Services and there would be no more official purchases from across the pond. However, it did remain a reasonably popular private purchase for British officers, and wouldn't be an unusual thing to find in a holster throughout the empire up until, let's say, about 1900, which is about the point it was fading away against competition from, say, the Webley. Coincidentally, in that same month that the War Department inspected their revolvers, uh, Von Oppen would receive a prototype of an improved pattern 1878. The big difference was in the grip, which had actually been shaved down at the rear, and had the plates, which had already started transitioning to natural hard rubber, reduced in diameter overall, making for a more natural grip. These would be accepted and started a fairly broad transitional period as frames were assembled out of order. Mine here, of course, has the small grips. I think they're very nice. Starting in early 1881, before this patent was even filed, another change was added to the 1878. This time, Mason had targeted that troublesome cylinder stop. While I haven't seen any hard data on further complaints, apparently it was proving problematic. So a much weirder system was actually put into place. Now both of those major improvements are integrated into this gun here today, so I think we can take a closer look. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you the revolver that you end up with when you have a Prussian man 
trying to describe the British market to American engineers. This is the double action army. Now you can tell how it kind of is from the Colt catalog. If I cover up this much at the front, we really do look like a single action army, although it is a one pieced frame. Uh, we also have at this backside, what looks like, well, the Colt 1877 for the most part. And although there are some differences, uh, at the very front, we have the barrel, which is literally straight off the 1873. This came off the same production line and could be fitted to either gun, hence why they have the same barrel lengths. The cylinders use the same blank, although they were more heavily modified in such a way to make them almost incompatible with the 73. Uh, we'll talk about that in a second. The ejector is similar, but just a little bit different, enough so that I don't believe that it's actually straight off the same gun. And then, of course, back here, no way. We have our steep knuckle, our big bell grip with our very aggressive toe. This is actually quite comfortable to me, if I'm honest, even though it's a little bit awkwardly front heavy. We have a very roundly set up mechanism that puts a nice little hump on the back of our hammer. And of course that hammer is the same positions as last time, all the way down for fire, manually rebounded, which now has a nice click. We have a half cock position, which is for getting in and out of that cylinder and being able to rotate it. But it is not a safety because if I pull that trigger, yeah, she's still going back. If I go to full cock, that gives us our single action pull, nice and light, boom, crisp and lovely. So. This gun is not going to confuse a lot of people from that era. Oh, I should also say uh, we have a lanyard loop that is very specifically shaped wide for a sort of wide leather belt instead of a simple little lanyard that might crowd up on anything other than a piece of string. This is kind of thoughtful. Uh, by the way, that chip is not original. This is a gun that's been there and done that, as you can tell, where in all directions some owner has gone to it with vice grips. You get the idea. This kind of proves the point though, that these are fairly rugged guns. Now, if I flip her over to the other side, we'll see that she is indeed a gate loader. And that gate has been set up very specifically. Supposedly there had been complaints about the Colt 1873's gate, because if you're a left-handed shooter, well, that might just, well, it might make your thumb bleed, especially if you're using it, say with a saber in your right hand or something of that nature. Well, on this guy, well, that's nice and round and easy on the thumb. And if you're shooting it left-handed, that's not going to tear up your fingernails. What a lovely feature. Disassembly is still a push button Arbor release like the 77. So I'll pull this guy out. Although I have noticed that this particular Arbor does not have that extra position at the very rear. And there's a reason for that. This Arbor is perfectly round. More on why in just a second. Instead, let's go ahead and get that cylinder out. Uh, we're rebounded on the hammer so we don't tear anything up. And we'll pull this guy free. Now this is the Colt 1873 cylinder, at least a reproduction thereof. And this is the 78. Couple things to point out. One, this has a clear vertical shelf followed by a little bit of reinforcement and then a scallop. This has a shelf followed by a really specific shape. There's sort of a, th this is definitely a shelf as well. And then we get a little bit of scallop, but this, hmm. And then it's tapered. There's, there's geometries here and they're there for a reason. More importantly, both of these would have come out of a similar casting or even the same casting, except this particular one is a separate piece. On the original, this is milled from the same block of metal. And you can even see there's a little bit of a circle in there. That's for a bearing that is the f at the front of the 1873. That same bearing is actually at the front of the 1878. Although you can see this one's got a little damage to it. I think a previous owner either froze it up or monkeyed with it in some way that I haven't really been able to get it out. So I'm gonna borrow from another 1878 that we happen to have that I can't show you yet, but it has the exact same cylinder, ooh, foreshadowing. And this one is in cleaner shape, so I can actually do this. That is a bearing that should be in all 73s and 78s, and it serves a very important function. That's because these are black powder guns, which means you want to have a way to enable rotation even when the gun is completely fouled up. 
the way to do that is to have not one, not two, but three points of rotation. So the arbor being perfectly round, unlike the 77, means that it can rotate in the frame. So if this surface that's touching on the arbor locks up and the uh, bearing inside locks up, then everything can just turn within the frame on the arbor. If the arbor is frozen, then you can turn between the arbor and the bushing. If the arbor and bushing are frozen to each other and the frame, then the bushing can turn against the cylinder. We have three layers of rotation. You have to foul or rust or ruin all three in order to get this gun to stop rotating. For a Frontier pistol, that is a really cool feature. Now, way off in 1913, surplus 1878 cylinders not used in production would be converted into 1873 cylinders by going ahead and pressing in a mock 1873 um, tooth arrangement, ratchet tooth arrangement, and by pressing out the original, which technically you could do, but please God, don't try it. You'll ruin your gun in a heartbeat by taking this guy out and pressing it in from that side out. The problem is this comes out easily on purpose and should be lubricated and maintained. This should never be removed because the gun is timed on it and it's very, very much force fit in there. Do not try at home what Colt did. But if you happen to have like a 1913, 1914, 1873, well, you may actually have an 1878 cylinder and not even realize it until you take it and look down the side to see that it's not milled out of the original construction. That's kind of cool. Now, the unusual shape on the cylinder teeth is because of the unusual hand and stop assembly. Normally, the hand in a revolver, that guy down in there pushing forward, is what rotates the cylinder, and then a separate component stops the cylinder. In this gun's case, however, the hand is also the stop. So if I hold the trigger down so that it's fully extended, we can see that we have a pushing element up here, another pushing element sort of down here to make sure that we keep rotating around the corner. But if you look very carefully, right in this lower corner, we have a right angle. And that's because, let me flex her in there, this surface here, very hard to make out, but that shelf that I'm touching up against, that surface is the cylinder stop as well as this surface being the cylinder push. So that means the hand ends up pressing up against itself. It rotates these teeth until uh, the tooth that it's pushing on is can go no further because the tooth much lower on the opposite side is abutting into the hand. You notice there's no other mechanism in here to serve as a stop. Now, this is the later pattern. On an earlier pattern, we might've had a hole right here for a, let's say resistance stop. I'm gonna talk about that in just a second, but the actual stop and go is all on the hand alone, which is, as far as I am aware, fairly unique for a revolver. And probably why it's not too hard to get one of these at a time, because once the hand wears, you've lost both the push and the stop. So just to see what that would look like, we'll go ahead and fire the gun as I hold the trigger back. I got very little move. If I really tighten down, I got no wiggle. If I loosen up, mm, I got a lot of wiggle. That's because the hand, which is attached to this trigger, is doing all the work. So the tighter I hold it, the better I go into time. Again, make sure you're pulling the trigger all the way through when you check these guns for timing, because where they're at when you have the hammer back doesn't mean anything on this particular model. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and add a little extra weight in there, like we usually do. Some of you might know what's coming next then, because I'm gonna show you that if the hand is both the stop and the hand, then that means when I release the trigger, all heck should break loose in this gun. So let me just, is my weight tie me up? There we go. Boom. And then if I release the trigger, we're gonna see roll back on that cylinder. Oh yeah. We'd be firing the same round over and over and over again, unless we had some sort of other mechanism. Surprise, surprise, it has something to do with me leaving the gate open. You guys see that little round sucker with the tooth on him right there? He's doing a lot of work because originally this gun had a center positioned stop, almost like the 1877. Although instead of being the full stop, it was just the resistance stop to prevent counter rotation. That's a lot of spring and movement for, well, a little bit of gain. And honestly, apparently there were complaints about it anyway. Instead, you can just go ahead and use the gate spring that's already kind of biasing this guy shut, right? He wants to be shut. He's putting pressure on the cylinder wall. And if you look at the way it's constructed, 
the cylinder teeth are right there, so we can just go ahead and grab those ratchet teeth. And what do we get for our energy? Well, if you watch closely while I work the action, oh, you see that slip on by? Watch that gate. That is an integral part of the operation of this gun. It lets the cylinder rotate one way and then clicks down and does not let it rotate the other. If I release the trigger, I can't move the cylinder back while the gate is closed. Let me do that again with the gate open. I'm gonna put pressure backwards. Oh yeah, I can do it just fine. But if the gate's closed, I cannot. Now I can brute force it, but I don't wanna tear up the gun. And honestly, it's only meant to resist gravity plus the weight of an uneven cylinder, which means you know, at best three uh, unfired rounds with three fired rounds in it. That's not a lot of weight to resist and it does it quite well. This is an ingenious little helper. Ooh, and you should always make sure that he's working whenever you look at one of these guns for sale. I've seen a number of them with the tooth chipped off. It does not look like an easy part to replace if I'm honest. The final feature I wanna cover is this inspection plate. Perfectly round, that's pretty cool. And if I flip her over, it has a reverse threaded screw. I cannot tell you how many of these I have seen uh, really ruined because people were trying to go uh, lefty Lucy instead of righty Lucy as is expected of this particular piece. Opening her up inside, well, first of all, <laughs> this circle is shaped, so make sure you put it back in the right configuration. But second, we can see our hammer and apply lubrication to the most critical parts. And that's about it. Mm, yeah, not seen a lot in there. Let me go ahead and pull that trick through and she slides on by. The most you can make out is the little back corner of the hand, the hammer itself, and obviously the strut, which works a lot like it did on the 1877. This window's a little small, so let's get a better look inside with the help of our animator, Bruno. Before loading this revolver, we'll need to manually pull the hammer to the half-cock position. Also, unusually for our show, we'd like you to pay attention to the loading gate. It's biased into one of two positions, thanks to a spring pressing on one of two flats cut into its lower extension. We'll load up our six rounds, close the gate, and take a look at the hammer, which is constantly biased forward by a large flat spring and restrained by an underside sear, which, in turn, has its own flat spring. Presently, the hammer is in the half cock position, with the sear locked against its center notch, allowing the cylinder to rotate, and keeping the firing pin out of the action. If we manually cock the hammer back, the sear catches at the rear notch. Pulling the trigger then tips the sear, freeing the hammer to fall. The trigger has a fairly unique shape, which allows it to act directly on the sear and makes room for a unique saddle pinned at its top. The trigger return spring acts on a spur on this saddle, returning the trigger forward on release. The saddle also connects to the strut, which works just like the one we saw on the Colt 1877. In single action, the strut is dragged along by the hammer, which in turn tips the necessary parts to rotate the cylinder, etc. In double action, pulling the trigger presses the strut into the hammer's notch, pivoting the hammer rearward until the strut slips free and the hammer falls. The strut is biased towards the hammer by this U-shaped flat spring, which also presses on the hand, biasing it towards the cylinder. This also works like the 1877. Double palmed, the tip starts the rotation, and the second notch continues it. However, the hand also works as a stop. Take a look at this right side of the hand squared up to act as the stop. As the hand rises, the next tooth on the cylinder, again specifically shaped, impacts the lower hand, halting rotation. Now the problem with this system is that when you release the trigger and the hand falls, nothing is preventing the cylinder from being dragged backwards. Well, except this little guy, which is cut such to allow the cylinder's ratchet teeth to pass in one direction, but not the other. This counter-rotation stop makes use of the already existing gate spring. All right, let's try the real thing. One evening in the month of May, Johnny get the gun, get the gun. I met the preacher on the way, Johnny get the gun, get the gun. Moses wept and ate some fries, Johnny get the gun, get the gun. Satan, come and don't you hide, Johnny get the gun, get the gun. The 
Point of interest, the 78 is apparently capable of handling appropriately loaded smokeless powder. Don't just shove any old 45 long colt you find in it. Now we use smokeless because of some inventory issues that have now been rectified. Uh, Colt would actually start warning buyers not to use smokeless powder in October of 1898. This was likely to prevent uh, user error and because they had not specifically been proofed for smokeless. Uh, in black powder loadings, the case dictates the volume, but if you fill up a 45 cold cartridge with smokeless, uh, you're going to have a bad time. Now, as I said earlier, Colt premiered this gun as the Double Action Army Revolver. However, it does appear that in some markets they switched to the name Double Action Government Army Revolver after the British purchases. Like with the 1877 model, Kittridge of Cincinnati would put his own name on the pistol, literally this time. He requested a marking etched onto the barrel, but only apparently for the long barreled examples. He might have overplayed it though, as Omnipotent never really stuck as well as Lightning or Thunderer. In October of 1880, the 4440 cartridge was actually added as an option. Colts listed this as the Double Action Frontier Revolver. JP Moore's sons would name this option the Frontier Six Shooter, having it engraved on the barrel of their orders for a time. The early shipments of the 1878, by the way, were still barreled at five and a half inches. While custom orders were possible, the standard sizes settled into four and three quarters, five and a half, and seven and a half inch overall. Barrels below four and three quarters inch were not possible thanks to the ejector unless you removed it. Emerging late in 1879, these somewhat more compact versions were supposedly first requested by retailer John P. Lower, marketing them as the Sports Pet, a somewhat subtle reference to the gamblers to which he marketed them. Like Omnipotent, the name didn't stick too well. Collectors generally call them Sheriff's Models. Most 1878s were blued, however just over 30% were nickeled, it was a premium option believed to be more rugged and longer lasting than that period bluing. Some people tried to split the difference with a satin finished nickel, uh, less reflective but still very protected, this was called a dead nickel at the time. A small handful were requested case hardened and occasionally turn up in the market. Chamberings would be varied. We already covered the initial 450 Adams, 45 Colt, plus the addition of the popular 4440. Thanks to the British adoption of 455 Mark I, that too would become a chambering, as would 476. Now those two British cartridges actually required widening up the cylinder a bit, which means a slight opening of the frame, so those cylinders don't fit in standard 78s, and the standard cylinders would be a bit roomy in a, say, a 455 frame. 476 would also require a new barrel. At first, Colt opened this all the way up to 0.471 nominal, but the British Enfield was bored to 460, and that was running fine, so Colt would soon do the same, making it backwards compatible with the 450 cartridge. Then there was the 44 Smith & Wesson Russian, sorta. This chambering was introduced due to requests out of Germany. If you recall our Reich's Revolver episode, the German Service 10.4 was nearly identical to the 44 Russian. 
There would actually be a big push from one German retailer to sell the 78 to officers there, or perhaps the government in an emergency, but he ultimately failed. Selling only roughly 200 revolvers domestically before getting help from von Alpen, selling the remainder into the Anglosphere. Next up, Chamberings 438 and 41 Long Colt appeared in 1885. They must have felt quite mild out of this big boy. Followed in 1888 by 3220 and 3840. Now, other oddball custom requests did exist, but these are, for lack of a better word, standard Chamberings for the 1878. The largest retailer of Colt's firearms in the period was Schuyler, Hartley, and Graham of New York, although Jacob Schuyler retired from the business in 1876, making it just Hartley and Graham for most of our pistols years today. From their inventory, we see a handful of 78s and other revolvers sold to the Wells Fargo Company, but more importantly, during 1883, Hartley and Graham began ordering large lots of 1878s in seven and one half inch barrels. Many of these were unsold by 1885, which is when they received a large order from the Canadian Department of Militia and Defense, which needed newer arms thanks to the real rebellion. One of the peoples of Western Canada were the Métis, a collection of frontiersmen of mixed European and native heritage, many of whom inhabited a region known as Rupert's Land. Almost 8 million square kilometers, this massive region west of then Canada proper was put up for sale by the controlling Hudson Bay Company, who was bullied by the British government into ignoring the United States and selling to the Canadian government for $1.5 million. Unfortunately, no one bothered to ask the native peoples how they felt about this particular deal. This created Friction. To keep the story somewhat short, the new English-speaking governor uh, met stiff resistance from the French-speaking Métis population, eventually resulting in armed conflict. Louis Riel would emerge as a Métis leader declaring a provisional government, attempting to split it between Anglo and native interests and negotiating with the Canadian government to establish Manitoba as a province. The trouble for Riel is that he also attempted to govern this Manitoba internally throughout the negotiation, which resulted in the conviction and execution of one Thomas Scott. So even though things were largely settled politically, when the Canadian government actually sent in their troops to administer their new province, there were calls for Reel's arrest. Wisely, he retreated to live in the United States for a time. By the 1880s, however, he was asked to return to Canada, this time to Saskatchewan, where, again, the native Métis people were fighting with the larger Canadian government. This time, the collapse of the Buffalo had led to near starvation, promised government assistance fell short, and the Métis peoples were being pressured to abandon their hunting and trapping in favor of agriculture. That's a major and difficult cultural change. Initially, Riel would actually help to begin untangling the myriad of negotiations between the government, the new Anglo settlers, and the native peoples. But in the intervening years, he had developed something of an erratic religious zeal, and he began to lose support in certain camps while falling into a more impassioned Métis anger at the encroaching government. In the end, the situation would erupt into open rebellion. In March of 1885, the provisional government of Saskatchewan was declared with Riel as both political and spiritual leader. That same month, an armed conflict broke out between the rebels and the mounted police, resulting in the Battle of Duck Lake. Predictably, the Canadian government would use its new rail lines to ship troops in to crush the rebellion. The Riel group was split between using guerrilla tactics or holding the town of Batoche, uh, the latter traditional defense being at the insistence of Riel himself. This proved a poor choice, and their defeat was secured in May. Rewinding just a bit, at the outbreak of this conflict, the Canadian Department of Militia and Defense realized that its equipment was dangerously outdated. Apparently, the bulk of their armament was made up of the British Schneider rifle and the very aged Colt 1851 percussion revolver, not ideal by 1885. A special vote in Parliament provided funding for more modern weaponry, and on the matter of handguns, the firm Hartley & Graham was contacted. This was likely because they had a large inventory in stock. Uh, we do know that there was at least one other agent dispatched to see if he could find arms elsewhere, and he failed to do so. So it just may be that they were the first ones to go, aha, and open up the uh, cases. All the guns had seven and one half inch barrels. They were nickel plated and chambered for the 45 Colt cartridge. 1,001 would be ordered at a cost of $13 each, a bulk discount for sure. 
But these weren't the only 78s to serve. Canada had hastily raised a number of men who, spread out and impatient, proceeded to buy more Colt 78s from the Hudson Bay Company's own stores, uh, charging them to the government account. By example, uh, Bolton's Mounted Corps purchased 25 revolvers at $25 each, plus cartridges, belts, and holsters before returning some days later for six more. Hartley Graham began uh, making their shipments in March, placing an order with Colt for the balance of over 600 in number. These shipped in April, which didn't leave a lot of time for them to make the trip to the Northwest and to get into the hands before, you know, action was over in May. Some old photos do seem to suggest that some of the guns did arrive, though. I'm not 100% sure. Interestingly, this short deadline also didn't leave a lot of time for manufacture, and it appears that some of the Canadian nickel-coated Colts actually have bluing underneath. They just nickeled right over them. Following real surrender and subsequent hanging, a report filed by the field office quartermaster pointed out that many of the Colt revolvers had not been left in Ottawa as expected. These had to be gathered back up and returned, with uh, some actually being sent on to Victoria, British Columbia, in order to maintain some readiness in the region. It also appears some of these revolvers saw service with the Canadian Northwest Mounted Police over a number of years. Interestingly, this would explain the preference for the 45 Colt cartridge over the later British 455 for half of the nation's Mounties by the time of the Colt New Service's introduction. Until then, however, these 1001 pistols, plus maybe an extra 100 from the ad hoc purchases, would remain the primary sidearm of the militia, which means that they would be refielded for the Boer War. Following the discovery of gold in Africa, tensions between Britain and the formerly Dutch allied republics of Transvaal and the Orange Free State would grow, eventually blossoming into a full-blown war declared officially in October of 1899. In December, Britain sent three expeditions into the Boer territories. All would be crushed within this Black Week. Subsequently, the call for many, many more volunteers went out and the armies were gathered, several Canadian units included, uh, with two raised and outfitted by the Canadian government. The first contingent, Special Service Force, made up of soldiers of the Royal Canadian Regiment and Canadian Mounted Rifles, would be armed with the shiny Colt double action still available in inventory. They stand out nicely in photographs from the conflict. Now the second contingent, we've actually covered them before as they received the Colt New Service revolvers that we covered in a previous episode. Other Canadian units were raised by the British government directly, and it appears that one of these may have also been armed with the 78, although that's more speculated than proven outright as it is. Uh, some 300 revolvers were sent from Colt to Lewis Brothers and Company in Montreal for one Captain Curran in January of 1900. So. Maybe. These were still 45 caliber, they also had 7.5 inch barrels, but they were blued in finish. Canadian service markings are a bit of a mess. Many of these revolvers have turned up with an MD mark, presumably for militia and defense. However, this mark was not applied to all of them, and was likely struck much later in their service life, perhaps after the Boer War even. Or maybe as late as World War I. Examples have also turned up with a sort of rack number in addition to the MD marking, and at least one with a number and no MD marking. Just a couple of 1878s have been noted to have World War I providence in the hands of Canadian officers. However, it hasn't been proven that they came from the Hartley and Graham Order of 1885. Now, believe it or not, there would be more military service for this particular old wheel gun, but it would come with some changes. So. With it still as is, who in the commercial realm really liked the 78? Well, it was carried by Lieutenant Marion P. Mouse, who headed the Apache Scouts in the Geronimo Campaign of 1886. William Frederick Cody, otherwise known as Buffalo Bill, would purchase two examples, both nickeled, with massive 9-inch custom barrels. George Maldon, famed as the Prince of Hangman, also carried a more modest and job-required Model 78. Lawman Jeff Milton was said to sometimes favor the Colt double action, and in 1889, the Atlanta Police Department would order 30 1878s nickel-plated 5.5-inch barrels and chambering the 4440 cartridge, with 40 more ordered the very next year. These were meant to work with their lever actions. Alright, let's review. 
Colt made their first double action small bore in 1877. This was in response to the British market demands. They then made a large bore military grade derivative in 1878. Complaints saw that model improve, notably the grips and cylinder stop. A number of chamberings were offered. Even before that could be done, 165 were purchased as an emergency measure by the British government for use in the Zulu Wars. Following a period of, let's be kind and say modest popularity, another lot of 1001 were sold to Canada as emergency supplies for the Riel Rebellion. These went on to serve in the Boer War as well, before being replaced by the new service. Our last episode on the 1877 was fairly long, and this one has already reached beyond the average time for one of our documentaries, but I actually have a lot more to say about the 78, including more military service and a whole new variation, which means I'm going to have to ask you all to be just a bit patient and wait for our next episode to wrap things up. I promise complete martial insanity as a reward. But before that, let's get May's opinion on the original 78. All right, once more, we've made room for May, and we have just enough room for this massive honking revolver. What happened from last time? <laughs> I miss, where's the small boy? <laughs> well, first and foremost, I want to say thank you to my buddy Tom for loaning us this piece. Yeah, it thanks, Tom. Is, uh, it's actually been a really good example for me, if I'm honest. An example of what? Well, it's been fairly well used. So, by example, on this particular gun of Tom's, okay. if I'm in the rebounded position, I can still roll the cylinder. Shh. I don't have to go to the half cock position. Okay. I, that's not correct. I was going to say, was, shouldn't that not be able to do that? No, it should put up a little more resistance than that. But this gun's got an old long in the tooth and it's starting to give up some of its secrets, right? Oh, no. But the good news about that is we shot one of the 78s that's been through some rough times, which means that gives us an impression of what it's like to have had one, let's say, on a battlefield, right? Sure. Because this is supposed to be a martial pistol. Now, what's your first impression visually when you've been handed that thing? Well, I've just come off the 77. Visually, what is going on here? It's huge by comparison. Thank yeah, you. Just, yeah, uh, let's just hold this up next to each other. Yeah, one of these things is not like the other. No, it definitely is not. I'm not a fan of that. Right. Just because of how big and heavy and honking this is now at this point. That's that's the, the that, honking. Yeah, the honking. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's it's all there. Um, and then on top of that, it weirdly looks very disjointed. It looks like I've got my uh, 1873 look style here up at the front, right? Yeah, the single action army. Yep. Your cover up, cover up the back of this real quick. And yeah. I'll show it to this camera. Okay. That's that looks like a single action army. Yeah, sure. Okay, we're there. Okay. And then wait, what's that? Why is there some weird giant circle here that? Yeah, now they just put. The, I have this axis. There literally circle. is a circle. Yeah, there's a circle and a circle. But even without the circle, the contours of the gun just sort of start this. They just sort of circle out for some reason. So right. even if you didn't have this plate, you you can see a circle here. That's super weird. And then they've taken the grip on a knuckle off the seventy seven practically. Right. So if you cover this much of the gun. It kind of looks like the 77 yeah, but right there. When you see that much of the gun, what you don't expect is, oh, no. God. No, these two things do not match. Yeah, it's like it, a chimera. Like, it's just sort of been together. You yeah, know? it's like somebody just welded it on there. Done. Yeah. Well, uh, again, we talked about this last time. Weird design goals, right? Yeah. We've got to take... Our, we got to take all the parts or all the milling operations or every bit of styling that we can from the 1873 Single Action Army. Mm-hmm and marry it to this double action system. Mm -hmm. And we've been told you have to have a saw handle grip because that's required to make this work well. So that gets added on. Okay. And then how you get that to work is your problem, right? Well, I mean, and then, again, we haven't, we don't have that full saw handle because we're still missing our, our little swoop out to the bottom down true. here. That'd be nice. Now, this is not Colt's first one piece frame, by the way. We saw it with his, the smaller pistols, like the new lines. And then there's some stuff going back to like the root. Oh yeah, the new lines, those are tiny. Yeah, but this is Colt's sort of first new full-size solid frame revolver. Before this, it was multi-piece frames like we saw in the 77. Mm -hmm. This is much more like we expect from a European revolver in that period, where it has this solid frame, and it's got a little peaky window, right? So Yeah, that is a really tiny peaky window. Yeah, they should have made the circle massive. <laughs> this is very novel, and the styling is very new for Colt in a lot of ways. So, I can uh, tell that. Outside of, how it, <laughs> outside of how it looks, okay. what's it like actually getting in your hands? I assume very light. Yeah, yeah, it's the lightest thing I've ever had, sure. No, are you kidding me? The weight on this is actually quite intense by comparison. So we've gone up from the 77, which was light, but a little on the dense side. And now mm -hmm. we've just gone up to 
big length heavy boy. That's pretty much it. I'm I'm honestly keeping up the weight on my middle finger right here. That's bearing a lot of it. Now that five and a half inch barrel was a popular option, but the next most popular option, as far as I can tell, was seven and a half inches of barrel. Why is that the next popular oh, one? Ballistic performance. Target shooting? No, it's longer range out of that four five long colt. Okay, sure. Yeah. Oh, by the way, we'll definitely get longer range with that. I'm going to get yelled at for saying long colt. Okay. There's a reason for this. There's 38 short and long. There's 41 short and long because mm -hmm. of the new lines going over the 77. There's technically no 45 long colt in the sense that colt didn't have a 45 short colt okay. that anybody recognizes. However, because of the Schofield having a shorter cartridge from the army, you got in the habit of saying 45 long. Okay. And then people would throw Colt on the end of it. And that's oh. why people say 40 long. Okay. So if you catch me saying it, I'm sorry, I've been talking a lot about 38 long Colt and 41 long Colt, and it just gets stuck in your Make head. Make sure to rip them a new one in the yeah, comments. I know. Yeah. Oh, uh, sure. <laughs> you you say, all know what I mean. How do you say Birmingham? <laughs> 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 okay, uh, but all jokes aside, so we've got the weight increase, we've got the length increase, we've gotten the grip over from the 77. Sure, the grip, it still should be comfortable, but on this gun... It's it, way more comfortable. No, it's not. It yes. is not way more comfortable. Okay, why is it less comfortable? It's just, it it doesn't fit with the weight now, unfortunately. It makes it kind of awkward to what do you hold mean it, it makes, up. I don't understand what's wrong with it. What do you mean what's wrong with it? My hand fits on this one. Oh, you're happy because uh, you're Oh yeah, this as... is it, right? See how all of my piggies go on the stick? He's so excited. On the 77, you had this nice full grip, right? Yeah, it was perfect for and me. I did not. My pinky was rolling off. So the now... men that were your size back then would have been so comfy with it. Oh yeah, look at this. This is this is a man's grip. Okay. Uh, well, actually, yeah, now it is. Yeah. Now it is. Um, all right. And then we have this massive trigger guard, although I know that we may talk about one at some point that has an even bigger trigger guard set Stop up. Stop giving away the secrets. Shh, I'm trying hard not to. Okay. Yeah, that's... I've got more room to get in there, but I still feel like... And I did have to do this on range. I definitely had to scooch down on the grip in order to get a more good, solid pull with it, unfortunately. It does, it does feel good to have that grip in your hand until you start pulling and you realize you really got your finger low. Yeah, you're, you're having sort to... Of shooting at this... Yeah, awkward angle. angle. It's not mm -hmm. comfortable, I will say that. And then cocking the hammer. Unfortunately, it's kind of heavy. I'm not a big fan of this hammer. And then it's it's an awkward reach up that I have to do with it too. It's not the most. There's also like weirdly less leverage with it. It's yeah. sort of this fat round hammer with like a short, the spur and the actual firing pin are sticking up very little off the body of the hammer. Yeah, it's a little nub on there. Whereas right on there. the 73, they actually stuck up quite a bit and there's mm -hmm. a fair bit of leverage over the, the turning, or the, the, the rotation point. Right, that so. one's really comfortable to pull. This one, not so much. And then the added weight increase to it definitely doesn't help. Yeah, how heavy is that trigger? Um, the actual trigger pull? Let me see. Well, single action, fine. But see, you're going to ride that hammer. So this is the thing. With this right. gun, I've noticed, if you try not to actually dry fire the gun, mm -hmm. uh, these are snap cap. If you actually try to avoid dry firing the gun, you run into this problem where any amount of tension on the hammer greatly helps the trigger. Because oh yes, like just just an ounce of pressure on that spur of the hammer goes much further than three ounces on the trigger because of the way the leverage is in there. I don't know why. So I've loaded up with snap cap so we don't tear up the firing pin. Okay. And why don't you just give that actual uh, do a single action and then double action. Okay. Now let's see where we're at. All right, single action. Not bad. It doesn't feel like I had to pull it very far, and the weight on that it's not the lightest single pull. I want right. to say, but it's it's actually not bad. It's okay. Maybe a pound. No. And then double action. Oh my god. I forgot how heavy that was. Honestly, I did. It's it's an incredibly heavy set, a, a double action pull. Like, I just can't even... Oh my god. And then, to ha I can't imagine being squinched all the way up here and trying to pull through. That feels like that would be horrible. Well, I mean, you can, because you did. Yeah, no, I did. <laughs> well, I mean, I scooched down the grip, though. That was the thing, was I scooched down because there was no way I knew, feeling that, that was going to be that horrible. Now, there is an adjustment screw. Yes. So, we could actually let this out some. I don't know. Let me double check here and see if I can do this even while we're... Sitting here. I can't. Don't mess with your mic, though. It's, I'm not messing with my mic. I'm Everything's just fine. warning you. Look, I'm just going to give it a couple turns. It's going to talk directly down to his mic, too. That's fine. Okay. They like the sound of my voice. Not true. Oh, wow. That's night and day difference. Yeah. That's really light mm -hmm. by comparison. Of course, now you have a screw sticking out that you don't want to lose. I mean, 
it's still it, captured somewhat, right? There's still some threads that are tucked in there. So what we're seeing is that the gun was set up such that you could adjust it to the ammo because this is a time of transitional ammo, especially 45 Colt and mm -hmm. maybe four, uh, 44, 40. Was it adjusted to the ammo or make it so that you can shoot the damn thing? The, t the two <laughs> popular cultures, like the biggest two, 45 Colt, 44, 40. Okay. Both of them tended to have insensitive primers because they were being used by single actions and rifles and things like that. Mm -hmm. So... Colt's solution for this was to design it in such a way, this is, by the way, the second version. The first version didn't have the adjustment screw. Oh, God. Oh, no, so no. The first version of the 77 did not. Sorry. Oh, okay. This had the adjustment screw from the factory. I'm Good. Sorry. So they learned oh. their lesson on the 77. So they had the adjustment screw. Mm -hmm. So if you're in a market where you can get the more sensitive ammo, the more double action friendly ammo, right? you just do that. And then if you have to use the heavy stuff, you just crank that screw down. Okay, sure. I get it. So that the, it has a better punch to it. Yes. Okay. Even with the full weight that you were complaining about, mm -hmm. still complaints about older ammunition not being able to set off. Damn, that's yeah. impressive. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then uh, the only other thing you really talk about, they changed up um, the gate. Yeah. Like this is a much improved gate, honestly, because there's a little nub there instead of not having to reach into the gate itself and worry about my fingernail, mm -hmm. a little nub sticking out helps a lot. Um, and there is it. still rollback. Don't you do it. Oh, right. I was about to do it and it wasn't even in half cock. Uh -huh. and it still could I do it because it was going to be worn. Yep. Um, but no, it does have a little rollback option where it lines up perfectly with the, I guess, just gate channel right here. Right. That's, That's pretty good. in the frame. Yeah, not bad. Do it. Do, it. do the thing. Do the thing. Oh, yeah. You don't have to do all. Oh, yeah, do as many no, as you want. Yeah, good. Oh. I've never been to do it all. Thaya says I can't do it all. But no, I like that it's the same um, ejector setup. It's spring assisted. Again, same issues potentially uh, that I have with the 77 as far as there could get mud or muck inside the cha travel channel right here. And this one actually, it does catch a little bit on the edge because that actual it's channel edge bent. yep, has gotten bent and deformed over the years. So it's not as smooth as it could be and does tend to snag from time to time. So. Yep, the concern was valid, I would say. All right. So what about actually shooting the thing? I still don't uh, have access to my sight picture until I pull the hammer all the way back. Do you so. not? Even with that stubby little hammer? Yeah, I thought I would. Okay, so no way. I actually gain. Hold on. Put it in the rebounded position. Yeah, in the rebounded position. <laughs> no, you can't, can you? I, I can a little bit. It's not, <laughs> it's not all. The, the thing is, it's not all the way. So it's, you, it's get a kit, you get a hint of rear sight. It's like I get half the rear sight, I want to say. It's like I get a little over half of the rear sight gain. That's kind of dangerous, though. Wouldn't that mean that you might align your... No, never mind. But then once you start to pull back a little bit, it starts to appear all the oh, way. Oh, good. So, yeah, no, you just adjust God. on the fly while working that 30-pound trigger. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Don't worry yeah. about it. Um, so, and then a sight picture itself, it's still... I think the V could still well, be a little bit deeper. first of all, I got a full cock because the half cock might... I still say the V-notch could stand to be a little bit deeper in the back, but again, this this front blade is still pretty pretty solid, I would yeah, say. Yeah, it has a nice tapered. Yeah, yeah, this this one's slightly better. I would say the front uh, sight is better on this one than it was on the 77. I'll okay. give it that improvement Okay. note. Um, and then recoil. <laughs> uh, We're shooting 45 Colt. There was a pretty good amount of it. Really? Yeah. Did it go boom? It did go boom, and it did rock. And then unfortunately, I don't have any sort of, like you mentioned before, any sort of outside... Uh, it could really stand a bell grip. Bell grip, yes. That would be uh, very beneficial on this gun. Now, you have shot a bell grip 45 Colt, we don't have footage of it, but right. May has shot an 1873 single action army. I have indeed. That was recently, actually. Now, it had the bell. Yep, but it didn't have the knuckle. Mm. The knuckle is crucial, I want to point out, because so, without the knuckle, all you do is slide home. Between this and a Colt 1873 single action army, which do you prefer to actually experience the recoil with? Don't make me say that, because I'll actually prefer this one, and I didn't like this one. <laughs> okay. Now, obviously, that one doesn't have double action, so you can't compare. Right. Single action where the trigger's all that different. Different enough that you care. I can't remember. I don't think so, no. The ones I've shot, the single actions, I've shot are reproductions, mm -hmm. and they tend to have smoother triggers. Well, that's just it. It has been reproductions, so uh, the yeah, reproduction the, was nice. Yeah, the reproduction single action army, single action feels better. Yes. I don't have an original from that era with this much age on it to compare. But no. at that point, though, I'm going to tell you in terms of actual boom, mm hmm I'm going to prefer this because yeah. I've got the knuckle. I've got more control with the grip. I can get follow-up shots faster because it's double action. Yep. And again, that knuckle, it is absolutely crucial because it at least stops me from going all the way up the gun. Okay. Which, again, this, the, the 73 that we tried, it's still... So what I'm hearing is reliability aside. Yeah. You would take this over single action army. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, yeah, obviously, also single action only, so. Okay. Meh. Hey, I'm just checking. You can't go wrong there. I've got the double action option. Okay, so recoil comes through. Okay. You reset your sights quick and easy? Nope. <laughs> okay. Well, again, it, even we've shown in, even in the rebounded position, the sight picture isn't completely there. So you can set it there, but then you're doing some micro adjustments right there on the fly. Right. And then it is not the most comfortable gun to hold up. As you're pulling through the trigger, there's a little bit of shake there because obviously not your best, not the easiest <laughs> trigger pull. Um, so no, definitely not the fastest shooter um, out of the ones I've handled and not the easiest for resetting. Mm. I can tell. You're having nightmares about it right now. I'm watching you play with the the wiggle of the trigger. Yeah, it's got a good bit of wiggle to it. It's fine. It's supposed to do that. Well, you're already halfway back. Yeah, no, but no, but it's, yeah, it's supposed to wiggle like this so it's halfway back. It's fine. Okay. It's fine. You're supposed to. What about, what about when you're all the way back? It's still supposed to wiggle a little bit. Okay, cool. Just making sure, you know. It's all fine. All right. Okay. So, (laughs) sorry, I was watching you like worry with it. Um, It's a very anxious gun. I'll put it that I'm trying way. to make sure we cover everything. 45 Colt as a cartridge. Right. Does that feel authoritative enough for you for a defensive round? It definitely has some authoritativeness to it. It's got a lot of bark to it. I think it does. I think it's a pretty significant stopping power with it. Yeah. I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with that. Do you feel like if you shot someone with 45 Colt, they might die? I mean, yes. I think at least they will be severely stopped. And <laughs> not that, uh, they will be dissuaded. <laughs> yeah. They will not be uh, entertaining a second go, I imagine. When they are, when they receive that round, they will say to themselves, she said, no, thank you. Yes, yeah, true. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, cartridge is probably Solid. beyond the envelope yeah, of good. We, we've improved there, yeah. sure. Um we're better than the single action army. The competitor for this, the the primo competitor that I can think of this, Smith and Wesson. Primo, okay. It's still probably single action. It's probably still the number three with the top break. God, that's simultaneous so weird. Eject. Yeah. No, that's an advantage. You have simultaneous injection. Mm-hmm. You don't have that on this. No, I don't. So you could load more rapidly with the Smith and Wesson single action only. Right. Number three is what we're talking about. Yeah, the Russian. Well, yeah, let's talk about the Russian because it's the one you shot for right. the show. Um, between those two guns, who are you picking? Well, between that gun and this gun, you mean? Yeah. Well, the problem is, is that the number three was amazing in so many ways. And it's so much more comfortable than this gun in so many other ways. But it's single action only. Mm-hmm. It's going to be inherently slower. <laughs> I'm going to have to go with this one. Don't make me keep doing this. Uh, these are guns that I love. And you're making me actually pick Look, the gun it, that I'm not comfortable with a, at all. If it was a rifle system, you could argue between whether it matters how fast you can get back on target or not right. to some degree. But these are handguns. They weren't meant to be like... Defensive range. Right. The, 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 the defensive range for handgun is a 30, 40 foot... You know, yeah, this is going to be me wrong. 45 Colt and it's got to be that. rapid yeah. use and this is going to be faster. Okay, so you've chosen day. this over the Russian I know. who you love. I know. Okay, you're a very practical that. person. Well, I have to be. That is what you have to be. Now, the other thing to compare this to. Okay. And this is this is where I'm going to upset the entire episode as we've recorded it. The infield? Yeah, Mark 1. Yeah, so that's all I'm thinking of. Now, we're going to have to show you guys something that you haven't seen yet because... Spoiler. Some of you might not know what the gun is, but we're going to steal a little bit of footage. Just a little bit of footage. Just a taste. We may have already shown it. You don't even know. I don't know where I'm putting it in. We're not there yet. But we are obviously working on the Enfield Mark I and Mark IIs. Right. As part of that, we now have a path clear for May to compare the 78 with what would have been immediately after it. So it went up against Smith & Wesson in the U.S. Okay. It went up against the, let's say, RIC and Tranters in Britain, but... You know, it kind of went up. It's weird. This went up against the Atoms, the RIC, and the Tranters. We haven't shot the Atoms. Okay. You shot the RIC and Tranters. True. But those are more pocketable. They are. Right? And a much or less powerful size, cartridge. Almost. Although, original chambering for this, 450 Atoms, right? Right. This seems to me, I don't even know if we want to go down this road. In my mind, that's overkill for shooting 450 Atoms. Mm-hmm. Like, I can do, see that. Do you even yeah, compare, there's no... Do you compare to the RIC? I don't think you can. Okay. I really don't think they're the same animal. Right. I don't. I, this would. If I'm shooting just 450 atoms, to me, this seems stupid. Yeah. I don't. I don't want it for 450 atoms. No. Now 476, which comes after it, that's getting into a hotter cartridge that needs a bigger gun. So it needs. It's got to handle the stoutness of it. Right. Yeah. This one definitely would be better for that. So Enfield Mark One is what introduces that. And size wise, pretty comparable. Right. Between this and the Enfield Mark One, so that's a single and double action with a simultaneous ejection system, although it loads through a gate. 
on paper, that sounds like it should win. So what do you tell me? I hate you. That's what I tell you. Uh, unfortunately, uh, infield uh, Merc 1 is not still the... Uh, Best shooter. Well, it's not the easiest to operate. I even had, I couldn't even reach up to the hammer. Yeah, to so operate it. We we're, we don't want to give too much hand. away of a future episode, but that gun has ergonomic problems. And then simultaneously eject on it my butt. Yeah, like it, it it definitely did not do it as smoothly. Even a clean, super clean, right. fresh. We're, we're spoiling an episode they haven't seen. The All short right. answer is the ejection doesn't work as well as it should. The trigger is just as heavy as this one. The All hammer right. is even worse to use than this one for yeah. single action. So you're going to choose the 78. Yep. And then, yeah, I'm I get... I'm not happy about so, this. So that's for 476, right? Right. So now we get into a really weird realm, right? Because it means that you've just told us that this gun that we've kind of been pooping on... Kind of. ...is blown out Smith & Wesson. It's yeah. blown out the gun that comes two years later. It's blown out the guns before it. It's Well, it's not necessarily blown out. It's just that it has a... Um, wider window of ammo than the Webley or, say, the RIC. Right. Uh, I would argue the Webley is better in a certain use case, which is if it's 450 atoms and that's all I'm getting, I'll go with the Webley. It's lighter, it's easier to yeah, use. Yeah, it's more right. ergonomically easier for you. So technically the Webley wins over it, but only in 450. Right. Yeah, I wouldn't want to shoot 45 Colt out of the Webley. No, definitely not. I don't okay. think it would be safe for it. By the time we get to 476, we'll have to start having a conversation about like the Trantor 78 mm -hmm. and then the early Webleys. So the Webley top breaks. So like right. we're going to have to talk about like the Webley Price and the Webley Kaufman. Okay. Those are guns we haven't shot yet. However, hmm, foreshadowing. <laughs> but... Uh, you have shot Webley top rakes. Yes. Like the Mark VI would be very close to sort of the size and weight of this. Yeah, because at first I was thinking of the Mark V and it's like, no, no, that's not going to have the weight or the length to it. But in, yeah, Mark VI. In private purchase by the early 1880s, mm -hmm. you could get a gun reasonably similar. It might be a Trantor 79. It might be uh, like the Webley uh, Price or Kaufman, but you could get a similar enough Webley in 476. Right. So if you could have a top break simultaneous eject Webley or Tranter product versus this. I'm probably going to go for the Webley just because I remember the, if we're thinking of like close to like the Mark VI in terms of the operational use of it, it was really quite smooth and easy enough to operate. There's also some other things that are coming in. You're getting. Um, Generally, a less complicated gun in a lot of ways, at well, least in the good. lock work. Yeah. However, the am I it, losing the stupid window? Yeah, you are. Well, no, they become a lot of them become solid frame with no windows. Some of them have side plates, some of them don't. There's a mm -hmm. lot of selection in there. But the short answer is, you're usually getting a simpler lock work mm -hmm. with a more complicated ejection system. Okay. But you like that ejection system. You yeah, liked it on the I, Russian. I thought it was fantastic. You liked it on the Webley. Uh, and it's get, really fast. You're no longer gate ejecting. You're no. just and load or eject, right? And then if I have something potentially like, even though it was in the commercial market only for the Perdo loader mm -hmm. or things like that, I'd have a much rapid more time right. getting in and out. And especially because of the emphasis on top brakes, you see auto rebounding hammers coming in, mm -hmm. which is a big deal. You don't have to manually rebound that hammer to keep it from laying up on a primer and sort of paying attention to that when you load and ready the gun. Right. Because you, what you don't want to do is go from the half cock position where you load everything up and then have to ease it down just far enough to be in that rebounded position and maybe miss and end up slipping a hammer or something. Right. And you don't want to uh, let it all the way down and just not be cognizant of the fact that you didn't walk it back to the rebound position. And then position. you're sitting on a primer. And then you walk around somewhere and, you, and it goes boom. Yeah. So those are very real concerns. The auto rebounding hammer is a big deal and it comes out basically the same year. Uh, we saw it when I was talking about that little um, Swiss 1882 I had. Uh, my 1878 was not available for filming this, but the 1878 Swiss, same year, mm -hmm. had, well, technically released in 79, but same year of design, had an auto-rebounding hammer, and Warnett, John Warnett had had that in the market for a couple of years. Gotcha. So they should have known to be able to auto-rebound the hammer. It wasn't included in this design. And that's a huge deal for double-action revolvers. Yeah, it's unfortunate, but it would have made it... It was a crucial piece. I do think you're right that it needed to have on it. Yeah. So I guess the problem with this gun is it's actually pretty good the day it was released and quickly fell into obsolescence by immediate competition. That's unfortunate. Yeah. So uh, what, were you, what did you think you were going to think about this gun when you saw it at first? Like, did you think you were going to like it? Honestly, I didn't think I was going to like it at all. It was because it, I went from, I literally just had gone from the 77, which I'd had such great ergonomic experience with holding it and shooting it, that 
when you hand me something that I instantly know is going to be bigger and heavier, and I can already see that trigger or the hammer on this guy looking like it did for that different shape, I went, mm, that's going to be a pain in my butt. And I knew it. And the moment I was started handling, I was like, of course, even the trigger right. is incredibly heavy, which doesn't make it any more of a pleasant experience. No, but the 77 got to introduce its own cartridges, which means that Colt had some control over how sensitive the primers were and things like that. No, yeah. not entirely because other people would load them and they'd load them poorly at times. But sure. they mostly had some way of introducing the proper ammo. 45 Colt had been out for a while. And there was lots of it floating around and they had to make this thing backwards compatible. So it's very heavy. It's very awkward. It's, it's not something I could see myself shooting all day, not like the 77. Not for pleasure, anyway. I actually quite love the 78. I don't know why. It's an awkward... I mean, I guess you finally fit on something. Well, first of all, I do like the way it feels. I like the size. It feels very authoritative. Like the gi giant circle? Well, I'm a, I'm a boy, okay. right? And there's that whole, like, it's 45 Colt, it's the big cartridge, uh -huh. and it's the big gun, it's the heavy gun, it fits in my hand. And there's something that feels very resolute about it. it. It inspires a lot of confidence. Now, whether or not the mechanism holds up to that, it's hard to say. This one's getting a little weird, like I said at the beginning of this. Yep, so we do have one that has some battle experience At the same time, it. I don't hear about these being broken down nearly as much as the 77s. Well, there is that, then. It is simplified to a fair degree, especially the way the springs are working in here. They're not nearly as vulnerable in this gun. Well, I doubt there was a lot of field servicing with that either. I doubt uh, they had people that were using them in the field were the ones that were operating on them, too. Yeah. The short answer is there is a small window in which I think this was one of the best choices of uh, single and double action revolver that you could make, assuming you wanted an extremely authoritative cartridge. Because in the European market, you just weren't getting this power, right? Fair. So if you wanted that power, that's your starting point, mm -hmm. then, then that's you pretty you much got. have to put up with the rest of this because everybody else that tries to do one this powerful right in that tiny little window mm -hmm. doesn't do... I mean, they do worse. I shouldn't say nearly as good because I wouldn't call it necessarily a good job. Right. But they do worse. Fair. So it's a weird niche firearm, and it didn't sell that many units by comparison like we saw. Mm -hmm. So, um, I don't know. I, I would ask you about taking into the Great War, but to be honest with you, we still have one more Marshall model yeah, to go. Yeah, we should get to that. Yeah. So, um, maybe we should leave it here. Okay. And we'll just put a pin in it, and okay. we'll finish up our thoughts on we'll the 78. We'll pull that pin momentarily. Yeah. Well, for us. For you guys, it's like two weeks, so. <laughs> All right. Y'all have a good one. Bye. Don't forget, supporting the show at the $5 level on any of these platforms not only keeps the history flowing, but also gives you access to our scanned historical documents. This month we added a wonderful 1917 Watch Officer's Manual, including some lovely national flags in color. Thank you everyone for the support and for your help.